Good evening. Welcome to worship tonight. We don't have any announcements, but I do want to remind you that our Lenten service next week will be on Thursday, not Wednesday. Let's open our service tonight with a special word of prayer. We believe, O adorable Savior, that thy whole life was made up of sufferings and that for sinful men, and in particular for us. O let us never cease to adore and love thee. It was for us sinners that thou wast all thy life a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that thou wast persecuted and reviled, despised and rejected, and hadst not where to lay thy head. And therefore we are bound to praise and love thee. How great were thy sufferings, when the very apprehension of them made thy soul very heavy, exceeding sorrowful even unto death, made thee offer up prayers with strong crying and tears, that if it were thy Father's will, the cup might pass from thee. We see thee, O incarnate God, who couldst command more than twelve legions of angels for thy rescue, out of love to sinners, humbling thyself to be apprehended and bound by the rude soldiers as a malefactor. We see thee, O gracious Lord, for our sakes, betrayed by the treacherous kiss of Judas, denied by Peter, forsaken of all thy disciples. We see thee, O spotless innocence, out of love to us, dragged to Annas and Caiaphas the high priest. We see thee accused by false witnesses, arraigned and condemned. We see thee, O divine majesty, out of love to us, spit upon and blindfolded and buffeted and mocked, sent to Pilate, then to wicked Herod, who set thee at naught, arrayed thee in a scarlet robe of mockery, and sent thee again to Pilate. We see thee declared innocent by the very traitor, Judas, who out of horror for his crime went and hanged himself. We see Barabbas, a traitor and a murderer, preferred before thee. We see thee for our sakes most unjustly given up into the hand of soldiers to be stripped naked and scourged. O King of heaven, we see thee out of love to us, humbling thyself to be arrayed in purple with a reed in thy hand. We see thee crowned with thorns to multiply thy torments. We see thee mocked by the barbarous wretches with their bended knee and with the hail, King of the Jews. We see thee, Lord God, whom the angels worship, spit upon again, and buffeted, and for our sakes made the scorn, contempt, and sport of thy insolent and insulting enemies. And though still declared innocent by Pilate, yet surrendered to the relentless cruelty of the multitude to be crucified, with all our hearts we lament and detest the hatred and outrage of sinners to thee. O Jesus, O Thou whom our souls love, give ear, we pray Thee, to our evening worship. <coughs> the very stones would cry out if we should fail to love Thee, who has so loved us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. But Thou hast laid down Thy life for us when we were enemies, estranged by nature and hateful by wicked works. We bless Thee for Thy cross. Love shines brightly inscribed above it. We clasp the record to our souls. And knowing that thou art the same yesterday and today and forever, we believe that thou lovest us now and wilt love us unto the end. Thus we come and present our hearts as a willing thank offering. Accept them, we beseech thee. Amen. We stand and join in singing stanzas one and two of hymn number 201, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. <laughs> 
Please join me in our call to worship this evening. A responsive reading from Isaiah chapter 8, verses 16 through 20. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait on the Lord. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? If they do not speak according to this word, Let us now hearken to the summary of God's law. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Please stand now and join me in our prayer of confession. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Hearken now unto the comforting assurance of the grace of God promised in the gospel to all that repent and believe. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Unto as many of you, therefore, beloved brethren, as truly repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with full purpose of new obedience, I announce and declare by the authority and in the name of Christ that your sins are forgiven in heaven according to his promise in the gospel through the perfect merit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Please join me now in singing stanzas three and four of hymn number 201, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. <laughs> 
Our gospel reading for this evening comes from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 17. John 10, 11 through 17. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Our New Testament reading comes from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release, release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Please join me now in confessing our common faith as expressed in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our Lord, and Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The text for our sermon this evening, Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, thy word is perfect, restoring the soul, making wise the simple, and enlightening the eyes of the blind, the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. We, however, are by nature blind and incapable of doing anything good, and thou wilt relieve only those who have a broken and contrite heart and who revere thy word. We entreat thee that thou wouldst illumine our darkened minds with thy Holy Spirit and give us a humble heart, free from all haughtiness and carnal wisdom, in order that we, hearing thy word, may rightly understand it and regulate our lives accordingly. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The outline for our message this evening is Christ's sufferings. Number one, his suffering was willed by God two, was an atonement, and three, will be rewarded. God willed Christ's sufferings. God had the principal hand in all that Christ suffered. It wasn't the scribes and the Pharisees, it wasn't Herod, it wasn't Pontius Pilate. 
But it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and it was the Lord who made his soul an offering for sin. And we can consider this in two ways. First, God's eternal decree, and secondly, God's overruling of Christ's sufferings. From the perspective of God's eternal decree, God ordained this from eternity. And that's why Christ is called the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. We can all this also see this in the prayer of Peter and the apostles in Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28, where they say, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Notice that Peter acknowledges the guilt of Herod, Pilate, the Jews, and the Gentile soldiers, but he asserts that the ultimate reason, the, the first cause, was not these mortal men, but rather God's eternal decree, what your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. This is very reminiscent, and in fact, it's in, intentionally so, reminiscent of Genesis 50 and verse 20, which reads, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. These are the words of Joseph to his brothers after the death of Israel, their father. The brothers feared that maybe Joseph would have second thoughts about forgiving them now that dad was dead. Notice two things, though. Joseph refers everything to God's sovereign plan. The whole thing, everything happened according to God's eternal decree of all events. And secondly, Joseph does not excuse his brothers for their evil. Joseph doesn't soft soap their guilt. In fact, he states it in very stark terms. You meant evil against me. The same act is described as evil and good. As far as Joseph's brothers were concerned, this was an evil act. It came from their sinful, evil, and spiteful hearts. As far as God was concerned, the outcome was good, the well-being of his church. Now, without going into a Hebrew lesson, let me just point out, as I have before, that the word rendered evil in our English Bibles is the Hebrew word ra, which literally means evil as in a moral evil. The, garden, the tree in the Garden of Eden was called the tree of the knowledge of good and ra, evil. So we see in this verse, we have a very straightforward declaration of God ordaining an act clearly described as morally evil, and it was as far as the human actors were concerned, but also described as a moral good, the rescuing of the church. The covenant family was saved from starvation. Considered from the perspective of God overruling Christ's sufferings, the men at the scene may have all been acting from their own evil hearts, and yet God was so ruling and governing all things so that nothing happened but what he had eternally ordained to happen. In our text, we read of the greatest crime ever committed in human history, the murder of the Son of God. All humanity conspired to do this. That's what Peter and the apostles are saying in Acts chapter 4. They cite Psalm 2, which says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. The apostles' prayer in Acts 4 is saying the same thing that David did in Psalm 2. Herod and Pilate are the king and the leaders of Psalm 2. The Roman soldiers and the Jerusalem crowds are the Gentiles and the people of Israel. In short, all humanity is represented here. The argument of this text is what's called an argument from the greater to the lesser. If the greater thing be so, then certainly the lesser things under its umbrella must be so also. If God willed and sovereignly overruled the death of his son, the greatest evil humanity has ever committed and will ever commit, then surely he is sovereign over all the lesser evils men commit. And since he overruled the crucifixion of his own son for the salvation of his people, then surely he will cause all evils he sends upon me in this valley of tears turn out to my advantage, for he is able to do it, being almighty God and willing, being a faithful father.
Jesus could as truthfully as Joseph say the words of Genesis 50 20 you meant evil against me but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive the greatest miscarriage of human justice ever committed in history was the killing of Jesus but the death of Jesus for his elect was also the greatest act of justice ever executed in history. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God's inflexible justice was completely satisfied. Justice was paid to the full. And let's remember that this was God's doing. Jesus didn't have to prevail with the Father to forgive us. Jesus didn't have to bribe God to love us. God sent his son. And Jesus condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. In other words, it was God's love for his people that caused him to send his son to redeem us. And it was Christ's love for us that impelled him to bear the wrath of God for our sins as our substitute. And it's the Holy Spirit's love for us that impels him to apply the saving work of Christ to our souls. God is one. God's will is one. It is one in its very essence. Our second point, Christ's soul was made an atonement. The, he the Hebrew literally reads, when you shall make his soul a sin. We find similar language in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. Now this doesn't mean that Jesus was made into a sinner or that he was properly was guilty of any particular sin. Had this been the case, then he couldn't have satisfied the justice of God. As our catechism teaches us, one who is a sinner cannot satisfy for other sinners. The explanation for this language lies in the way that the Old Testament speaks of sin and sacrifices for sin. When the Old Testament speaks of sacrifices that were specifically sacrifices for sin, it calls them either chata'ah or asham, both of which are the same exact words used for sin. Now some scholars have suggested that this was just a shortcut, you know, as if saying sacrifice for sin was too long and people over time just clipped it to sin and then the context would explain whether it meant sin or sacrifice for sin. I say we have to reject that theory because the writers of Scripture were not left to coin new words or fidget with the language. Every word they spoke or wrote came from the mouth of God and therefore this interchanging of terms is inspired and therefore it is theological in nature. God is teaching us truth by this, especially considering that both sets of words are used interchangeably. For what it's worth, it doesn't seem all that complicated, and I assume most of you can already tell where we're going with this. The animal that was sacrificed was a substitute for the sinner. The animal was paying for sin, and therefore it was entirely appropriate to say that the sacrifice had become the sin. So this isn't some obscure metaphor, it's not a giant logical stretch, it's as plain as the nose on your face. That lamb personified the guilty sinner. That's what a sacrifice is in the biblical sense of that term. Our text says, you make his soul an offering for sin. The you spoken of here is God the Father. Now, while God is one and all the works of God can generally be attributed to all three persons of the Trinity, only the Son was incarnate. And this is why the Bible depicts salvation in a particularly Trinitarian way. The Father is said to choose those for whom the Son will atone. The Son becomes man in order to atone for those whom the Father has given him. And the Spirit applies the work of Christ to the hearts of those chosen by the Father and redeemed by the Son. And the Holy Spirit does this, as our catechism teaches us, by creating faith in my heart by the preaching of the gospel. And this, I think, cuts right to the heart of a common misconception that people have about God. And I'm speaking of the false notion that the, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, but the God of the New Testament is a God of love. There was a heretic named Marcion who lived from the years 85 to 160. 
And he's the first person to popularize this terrible notion. Marcion began by driving a wedge between the Old and New Testaments, not unlike today's dispensationalists. He drove this wedge in so far that Christians were to completely reject the Old Testament, and any time the New Testament either quoted it or cited it as proof for its doctrines, Marcion said that we have to reject that portion of the New Testament too. Or at the very least, he would say, it's dealing with, a, with an issue that's something specific for Israel and not for Christians. Now, if any of that sounds familiar to you, you will see just how potent the poison of Marcion's evil doctrine is. And you'll see that he more than deserved the anathemas the church has heaped upon his head over the centuries. In our day, this error survives in the idea I noted a minute ago that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, but the God of the New Testament is a God of love. People often pit Jesus against God as if God were some evil tyrant dying to, for an excuse to kill us. But Jesus is the big softy that'll talk God out of it. I cannot express how blasphemous that idea is. First of all, it denies the doctrine of the Trinity by making Jesus a separate being from God, and then it doubles down on the error by presenting God and Jesus as having opposing wills. God wants to kill us all, and Jesus is trying to stop it. That is a lie from the deepest pit of hell. You can see the same error in brethrenism and dispensationalism with the radical dichotomy between the Old and New Testaments. You can see it in Rome's use of Mary. She's a mother, so you know she has a softer heart. She'll understand. God is such a hard-boiled authoritarian. We need someone to soften him up for us, and who better than a mom? And let me say this in as clear a terms as I can. God does not need to be induced to love his people, either by Jesus or some other mediator or mediatrix. Jesus didn't come to induce God to love his people. John 3, 16, For God so loved that he sent his Son. Now granted, we're treading on the verge of some very great mysteries here, thinking about the relationship that obtains between the persons of the Blessed Trinity. But we can easily see that God's love for his people is what induced him to send his son. Moreover, it was God's love for his people that ordained a way to work the impossible. Man owed a debt to God that he could never have paid. God couldn't settle the debt without satisfaction, without violating his own character. He didn't know it. And so God became man in order to stand in the stead of his people and work out their salvation for him. God made Christ's soul a sacrifice for sin. The word soul, nefesh in Hebrew, is often a general term that means life. His life, Christ's life, his body and soul were made an atonement for sin. And since we're defining terms, let's define atonement. In the simplest terms, atone means what the letters say, at one. Just put a space between the T and the O. Atonement is an at one It's a reconciling of parties who are at enmity with each other. And this leads to a very important observation. Since Christ was made the sacrifice for the sins of God's people, there is no hope of salvation but in Him. Our text reads, My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The many are those whose sins Christ bore. Only in Christ can be found access to God, forgiveness of sins, righteousness, and life. You're probably familiar with John 10.10, 10, where Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And if you've ever heard that passage explained, without fail, you probably heard it said that the thief is the devil. But read the context and you'll see that this is not what Jesus said. Verse 1 reads, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And in verse 7, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The thief is anyone who attempts to enter the kingdom of God in any other way than through Christ, the door. Jesus is the only way to salvation. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you try to attain salvation by your own works, by a combination of Jesus' works and yours, 
by coming to God through the saints, through obedience to the church, through any other way. But faith in Christ's finished cross work, you are the thief. You're guilty of breaking and entering. You didn't enter through Christ, the door. Jesus also taught this in the parable of the wedding. Once the feast was underway, we read that the king came in and found a man who was not wearing proper wedding attire. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's pretty cut and dry. A person who seeks to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven in any other way than Christ's robe of righteousness will be cast into the eternal torments of hell. Christ's sacrifice is the only satisfactory sacrifice for sin. First of all, God ordained it to be so. God is not satisfied, as we saw last week, with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil. Secondly, all of the Old Testament sacrifices were simply shadows of this one sacrifice. They could not, in fact, remove sin. Hebrews says that those sacrifices could not make him who performed the service perfect. Jesus' one sacrifice of himself did what hundreds of years of morning and evening sacrifices couldn't do. Jesus, one sacrifice of himself, did what hundreds of days of atonement couldn't do. Jesus, one sacrifice of himself, did what Solomon's 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep couldn't do. Thirdly, nothing but the sacrifice of Christ could be sufficient to save God's people. Nothing else, no one else could have done it. In Isaiah 59, 16 and 17, we read, He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. Christ is the arm of the Lord. In verse 1 of our chapter, Isaiah 53, he is called the arm of the Lord revealed. No creature can intervene between sinful man and God's just wrath. And therefore Christ put on righteousness as a breastplate, helmet, uh, salvation as a helmet, the garments of vengeance for clothing, and zeal for God's house as a cloak. Our third point is that Christ's suffering will be rewarded. Our text reads, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Now, before we apply ourselves to this final point, let's just make a quick observation here from that phrase. I think it tells us something about the justice of God displayed in Christ's sufferings. In our last sermon, we saw that the sufferings of Christ were fair and according to justice. Jesus' passion was not overkill. Everything he endured was exactly, precisely what it took to satisfy the justice of God for the sins of his people. Not one drop more, not one drop less. Our text doesn't say, he shall see the labor of his soul and complain that he was gypped. Jesus did not go blindly into his work as mediator. He knew what it would cost. And this is why we always find him referring to his work as that which the Father sent me to do. Now in Isaiah 49, we have a very interesting passage that sheds some light on this. The text is presented as a dialogue between the Father and the Son regarding the Son's work for the salvation of God's people. I want to read verses 1 through 6 for you. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me. And he made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he has hidden me. And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him, 
For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, there is a lot of profound theology in that passage, and it would be very edifying to go to it all in great detail. But we must limit our observations to the points that are relevant to our subject tonight. This is clearly Christ speaking here, who says, The Lord called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. Only Christ could have said these words. Notice also that he says, My mouth is like a sharp sword. Reminiscent of Revelation 1.16, where John describes Christ with these words, A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. Christ was certainly the one formed from the womb to be God's servant, to save those who were lost, to restore the chosen ones of Israel. Now what I want us to notice is how Christ says, My just reward is with the Lord, and my work with my God. He's speaking of reward for his work, and what is this work? It's the salvation of God's chosen people, and he, Christ, worked it. But also notice how this passage teaches us that God's plan has always been a church that exceeds the national and biological bounds of Israel according to the flesh. Scripture says, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. And again, the scripture says, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. Again in Isaiah 11, Scripture says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him. So we see that from the beginning of time, God has always willed that his church stretch beyond the biological bounds of national Israel. But Scripture is also clear that this will not come to pass until the Christ had come. The spoils of his war are the nations of the earth. The pro Father promised this to the Son. It's in Psalm 2 as well. The nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So we look back to Isaiah 49 verses 4 through 6 and we see here what looks like Christ protesting that if Israel alone were to be saved then his work would not be worth it. He says, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. And the Father's reply to this protest is, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Israel and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. The reward of Christ's work is that he will see his seed. And that word seed is a clear allusion to God's covenant promise to Abraham. In Genesis 17, 7, God swore, And I will establish my covenant with, between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And Paul explains that this is actually referring to Christ. In Galatians 3, Paul notes that the text did not say, and to seeds, plural, but to thy seed, singular. And therefore the seed referred to in the covenant of grace is Christ. And in this seed, all nations of the earth are to be blessed. And therefore the promise to Christ is that he will have a seed of the many whom he will justify by bearing their iniquities. So God says, I will give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, isn't that amazing? Over 700 years before Christ came and to suffer and die for the sins of his people, God was proclaiming that the glorious fruits of Christ's work would stretch across the nations and save the Gentiles who were once aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. And here we are in 2021 in Trip, South Dakota, hearing of God's eternal decree to work out our salvation with his own arm. The salvation of everyone who has ever trusted savingly in Christ's work, either before he came or since, has been the reward for his faithful execution of his office as mediator.
the labor of his soul. Let us pray. Almighty God, the Father of mercies, we beseech thee graciously to hear the prayers of thy church, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men, and to suffer death upon the cross. And according to that new covenant which he sealed there with his precious blood, put thy laws into all our hearts and write them in our minds, and then remember our sins and iniquities no more, for the sake of him who when he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on thy right hand, and now liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. We now pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in singing the first two stanzas of hymn 195, Nothing But the Blood. <laughs> 
I never use this stuff, but every time I come down, I see it there. It's just like impulse. I got to do it. <laughs> Oh, it's on. 